Uh, so welcome everybody to the March 28th, uh, 2024 um, meeting of the Town and Deerfield Conservation Commission, uh, starting at 6.02 p.m. this evening. Uh, we're doing an old uh, remote on Zoom. And um, so certain meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely without an alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with House Bill Number 58 of the 193rd General Court, which extended the governor's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MDL Chapter 30A, Section 20, until March 31, 2025. Uh, the meeting has been posted on the town website, and um, all the dial in numbers and Zoom links, et cetera, was uh, posted there, uh, along with the agenda. So. Um, I will call the uh, the meeting to order this evening. Uh, I have a couple of meeting guidelines uh, for everybody that's attending. Uh, please speak one at a time. I'll uh, follow the Deerfield Code of Conduct, which is to be respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, and non-repetitive. Um, I have two other um, items uh, for this meeting. Um, if there are any questions or comments, um, from anybody other than the commissioners, um, please direct me to the chair and I'll put them to the right folks. And uh, secondly, unless you're presenting, please keep um, your comments to a two to three minute time, uh, time frame or less, um, just so we can keep the meeting flowing. Um, that's great. I think there's some folks that uh, have muted out, so that's wonderful. And um, with that, I'll take a roll call for the uh, members now, just to make sure we have a quorum. Uh, Sean Libby. Sean Libby here. Uh, ben Byrne. Ben Byrne here. Uh, Kate Devlin. Let me see the absent. Uh, Anne Mary Claudier. I don't see Anne or Anne. Uh, Peter Law, uh, present. So. We are set to go on that. Um, so let's go through the agenda. Um, I can pull it up on my own screen if you want to look at it, but um, if not, we can just go forward. Everybody, I would wish to have the, uh, uh, the minutes sent out to everybody. So uh, the first order is looking at the minutes from our 229-2024 uh, meeting. And the meeting, uh, the minutes were sent out to everybody. Um, so, commissioners, have you received? Have you chance to review? Are there any revisions necessary or anything to look at um, given those minutes? Um, just a comment that yeah. we may want to uh, push the review of the meeting minutes until the next meeting. Uh, if Ben abstains, then we don't have a quorum to vote on it. Uh, uh, so if yeah. it's just you, me and Kate voting pro only because we were there and there. we should just push it to the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and I don't think it takes a, a motion to do that, but I'm yeah. not sure. No, I, I think that's a, a good point because that wasn't there. So we'd have to abstain. So, uh, Amy, why don't we just put that on the agenda for the, uh, April meeting. Uh, we'll leave that one open and, um, we won't use a uh, minute for 229 this evening. Okay, yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm making my notes. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda, um, some of the old business. Um, last month we talked about the Antonellis Farm uh, RDA, which was approved, and before any construction on the barn went forward, uh, we needed to do an erosion control uh, review on that. That was completed on March 11th uh, by myself. Uh, no other commissioners were present, um, but we, uh, I would have to say, the, uh, the farm did a great job in putting in all the erosion control, sediment control um, per our requirements and um, had them all in place um, before the um, construction started. Uh, so I sent notes to to the file and then I reviewed them all, all the uh, measures that we had put in place 
and um, that one's set to go. So I don't know if there's any questions on that site visit. No, okay. Uh, the second site visit, um, the erosion control site visit, was for the Sunny Days project on Greenfield Road. Uh, that was held on March uh, 19th. Uh, myself and uh, Ben Burns, Commissioner, were present for that review. And that was a review of all of the erosion control, the primary erosion control that was uh, required in the staging area uh, right after the a Greenfield Road in that area. And um, from uh, my review, and then we jump in if you saw anything different, but all the road control fences have been inspected and there was in place um, for requirements, um, except for the extension of 200 feet on both sides um, of that staging area. But the fencing was in place, and enough of the areas were, you know, going ahead with that staging area right up to of the road uh, was fine, and the um, the additional fence will be installed probably by now. Um, so I expect to have another call to go over that um, to that area, and just to let the commission know the next steps um, to be finished. <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, April and by early May, the installation of the 24 inch ICP and box culverts <clears throat> for the drawings. Um, there will be uh, gravel brought in from Delta Sand and in gravel to construct the driveway and staging areas. Uh, then they will install the remainder of the silk fence outlined in yellow, which is around the whole project perimeter. Uh, we'll go back to do an inspection of all silk fence outlined. At that point, um, they will then start to build in uh, the wetland replication area um, with their wetland specialists on site um, for the approved plans. Um, next step to that would be point to see the wetlands replication area uh, for the plans. And um, then we'll do a, another inspection of the completed wetlands replication area. Um, so we've been over there a few times and um, what I've seen, and then Tim Ben, if you could comment on that or uh, agree or not. Um, but um, they're following the plans and requirements that we have outlined <clears throat> in their um, orders of conditions. As far as I can tell, Ben, any comments? No, nope, I agree. Uh, it's coming along uh, as uh, as required. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. So that's this update. Um, the other update on old business. Um, I did a, a number of other site reviews um, this past month. Um, several of them were at to Hawks Road, and that was based on the um, emergency certificate that we put together uh, with the DDP for um, replacements of our culverts and, and so forth up in that area. I met there on March 1st with Mark Stinson who would ask the DEP for our review. Um, and we concurred with what was occurring, what was happening in that location. Uh, I met again on the 19th of March with uh, Chief Petrari, the emergency energy director, I think the doubts. I might have got this type of uh, wrong on that one, but um, yeah, with Chief, and we've gone through there uh, to review and made some changes and some upgrades and some updates to what we're doing there and then outline uh, next steps. And um, had several other visits to Hawks Road uh, since then to just uh, monitor uh, the work that we're doing on both culverts and on the berms and the, and the stuff on the side of the road. Um, so that was most of the uh, site visits and the other old business related to what we talked about in the past. Any questions, comments from the commissioners on that, any of that activity? What was the date you met Mark Stinson? I believe I had on my calendar at um, March 1. Okay. Is that the date you were up there too? Yeah. No, I think so, I was there the yeah, prior man. day. Yeah, yeah, prior and yeah. Yeah. 
Let me get another review. Um, so, so we're moving ahead uh, on that uh, emergency uh, in that project <clears throat> up on the hill. All right. Um, if there's no other comments on the old business, we go ahead and open the uh, hearing for RDA on 144 North Main Street. Okay. Let's see no additional comments from anybody or raising that just goes to the computer. Um okay. Um so then uh at this point I would open the hearing on the RDA at 144 North Main Street. Um this is a request to consider the uh determination of stability filed by James Heller to see if the work depicted on the plans uh, for that property. Uh, which is identified in the assessor's record as maps 151, lot 81, is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, we have that information. Everybody has that information in your meeting packet. And um, I can hold that up and show it on the screen if everybody wants to see it, but if everybody's missing it, are good without it. Um, we can go ahead and uh, see if... Um, Mr. Heller or a representative uh, would like to kind of point out what they're going to do over there at that property. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. This is James. Um, uh, nice to virtually meet you all. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've got uh, um, Bloody Brook Farm here. I've owned it for a little over a year with my uh, wife. Um, but of course, this farm's been in operation for quite a long time, going back as far as uh, really before any of us were born. Um, so uh, after owning it for one growing season and seeing what was happening, um, some some people in town told me to expect some water issues. And of course, it was pretty terrible. Um, the field retained uh, an excessive amount of moisture uh, to the point where it, essentially the entire butternut squash um, crop was lost due to rot and the corn uh, did very poorly. Um, so in, in reviewing satellite photos, this isn't specifically part of the um, packet, but you know that, that are available through MassGIS over the years. You can see how there were um, pretty substantial drainage ditches on the, uh, especially the south side of the property, which uh, if you look through the years have um, essentially filled in with trees, bushes, and um, soil. Um, so that's obviously a big part of the problem. Um, but unfortunately, those the, the main south drainage ditch goes through, it's at least two other properties to the south. Um, and there used to be some agreements, I understand, about keeping it clear. Um, but they, my current neighbor to the south, uh, you know, I think she's almost 100 years old. I mean, no real interest in taking care of any of that. So actually, there's, um, in doing a lot of research, um, I found um, some people that are starting to use drainage tile in the valley um it's been in use for a very long time since at least you know in america since the turn of the century and they used to use clay um but not as popular in new england as you might find out in the midwest um for example but um essentially what it does is it just like the french tile around your house it uh, allows the water to filter into it and more efficiently leave the field uh, this would increase yields dramatically and uh my read of the law is that we're exempted because it's an ongoing uh, farming operation. Um, and this would be a, a normal improvement to land and selling subsurface drainage system. Um, and quite honestly, seems to be the least invasive um, and would all remain within this parcel. It wouldn't have to uh, rely on neighbors to clear out their ditch. So um, that's that's kind of my short 101 uh, open for questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have uh, all your documents in our meeting packet. Uh, any questions from uh, the commissioners, Don or um, Ben? I'm not sure Ben. Uh, oh, no. Andrew is here too, so I, I... I'm semi-familiar with it with YouTube videos, but... Um... It seems pretty straightforward stuff. Did um, per Mark Stinson's question, did it, is there an existing outlet in the Bloody Brook from past drainage 
um, for that field. So this field has never, as far as we can tell, never had drain tile. Um, it just has um, two ditches. Uh, ditches, one to the north and one to the south. The one to the north kind of empties into um, this intermittent stream that has a second bridge, um, which just south of that, uh, based on the map, you can see that's where they've got the outlet. Now that's that's not 100% uh, where each pipe is going to go exactly. It's, it's like a 95%. That's based off of uh, satellite LIDAR imaging. Um, and then before they do any, um, they've got a machine that is kind of digs a trench and lays the pipe simultaneously. But before they do that, they're going to run over the whole field with um, a GPS um, uh, receiver and get an actual elevation to, to see how deep they need to put it. And, you know, the, the outlet might shift south a little bit, um, but that's kind of the best guess right now. Thank you. So just a clarification on that. So there's no current discharge point per se. It just goes into the, uh, the, the discharges the would just be where the the two ditches um, yeah, the the enter area. the okay. bloody brook. And are those both on the property that would be considered agricultural use? That's on your property. Those, yes, they are. And the um the, the only nuance being the one on the south side. Uh, which is more substantial, passes through um, two adjacent lots, and the the parcel just to the south used to be farmed um, by the two owners ago of the Bloody Brook Farm, um, but it's it's kind of overgrowing. Um, it hasn't been used in some period of time. I'm not sure how long, but um, okay. yeah. But in this plan, that, that discharge point would be on your agricultural Yes, it, Probably, it, yeah. based yeah. on this uh, plan, it would discharge within okay. the boundaries of the APR land. So, yeah, and it's been—I uh, uh, know that property. So it's been a consistent agricultural use right through. You said you bought it a year or so ago, um, but it's been agricultural use. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can see on years. the yeah on the satellite images that it's been continuously farmed for one thing or another. Okay. Any idea of the amount of water that may move from your field to Bloody Brook in a given time period? And, and that's, I, know I that's actually don't have any question. flow rates. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's essentially the same amount of water. It just yeah. would come out more efficiently. Yeah. Um, so it all makes its way to the brook eventually, but the way yeah. it goes now is just too slow and causing rot. Yeah. Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, a lot of drainage ditches that uh, just were not kept up that uh, were inconsistent or appropriate use. Um, okay. Any other questions from the commissioners and Mary? Yes. Yeah, you could no, I want to apologize for being late, but I am kind of familiar with the product that he's talking about. So, yeah. 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 Okay. And then the, just the last thing I'll say is um, it's very expensive, as you can imagine. And this is all con dependent on me receiving a grant from the state uh, for um, new ownership of uh, APR farmland. You can submit for um, uh, up to $35,000 for um, something that'll kind of rectify the sins of the past, which this it's pretty well documented that this did have good flowing ditches and they, it doesn't currently because they were neglected. Um, so I'll know about that, I'm told in, in August, <laughs> but the uh, application is due in April. So that's why I um, kind of getting on this earlier in the year, but yeah. um, uh, hopefully uh, we're chosen. And if so, we'll uh, move forward with, uh, you know, depending all of this, um, move forward with it after this current growth season uh, in the fall. Okay. Yeah, familiar with some of the different grants, I mean, not all of them, but uh, some of them do require uh, an RDA or that type of determination. Yes, RDA this one grant, specified but, that yeah. uh, they wanted the Conservation Commission to, yeah. even though we thought we were exempt, to, to weigh in and uh, be advised. Yeah, yeah uh, no, definitely greatly appreciate that. Um, we did also... Um, because it was submitted, uh, they go through the DDP, in our, our, our Western Mass Trigger Rider, Mark Stinson, um, did comment on it. And 
Um, so the question is, where is the discharge point being eligible for use? You're saying, yes, it is. Is there already a discharge point there? Um, discharge point would be a, a random point uh, within the uh, the drainage ditch route, from what I understand. So I think they're all there within the air for use. Which, from my understanding, and I have to get a little bit uh, regulatory on it, with the, with the Wetlands Protection Act regulations, but um, under CMR uh, 10.04, um, it's going to be section uh, B7. It just said the cleaning, et cetera, et cetera, repairing. I'm not going to read everything or restoring of existing man made or natural water management systems, um, such as uh, subsurface drainage systems, water facility, water storage, all in this order to provide drainage, prevent erosion, provide more effective use of water, or provide uh, for efficient use of equipment, and all the purposes of maintaining favorable conditions for ongoing growing or raising of agricultural commodities. Um, which would be the exemption to the uh, Wetlands Protection Act for, from my reading. Um, so, any to uh, commissioners, any comments on that specific um, section of the uh, CMR? I think, sir, um, yeah. that's the normal maintenance. There's also a section about normal improvements, which um would allow adding drain tile where it didn't exist before yeah um it was mentioned on the uh normal improvement and uh, maybe you read the same thing under, and I, I just didn't hear yeah it was under um b b and this is b would be uh the subsection the initial subsection is normal maintenance of, of land and agriculture use um, it goes through a bunch of different things, but then um, subsection seven, uh, mm -hmm. I can know specific things there. So I think we have that correct, but it would be under C10, CMR 1004B, and one of the uh, subsequent, um, and there's only uh, 16, 17, and we're going to see eight, 17 of them. Yeah. So I think we're in there. Um, so with that, and what was any other comments? Can anybody? Sure. Yeah, so we got some of the... yeah, uh... Mr. Chairman. Yes. Hi. You are Robert Tipad from OIC. <laughs> My name is Bob Decker. Well, Hi, Bob. I'm very familiar with this piece of property. Uh, I live on Kelleher Drive, and there's two parcels separating my property from uh, the property in question. My question basically deal is how much more water, is is there gonna be additional water shed into the Bloody Brook and how long is, is it going to take to get there? And is it going to raise the stream any higher than what it does now? And if we get rain for two or three days, the, it basically reaches the top of the culvert even though the culvert was replaced under Keller Drive. Is this going to make that any worse? And next question is, uh, this is the scavenger's property is next to is, and that's where the ditch is, where it's being overgrown. Uh, the question is, the other property is owned by, uh, by Steve Barrett, and uh, it, that, that's next to my property. But there is a swamp on the, on the east end of, Steve Barrett's property, and I think on Descavage's property, which has no outlet uh, because it drains, used to drain into, it, it somewhat drains into, down into Kelleher Drive, into a little bit of a basin area. And then there's a brook or a tributary of Blacksmith Brook that goes underneath Kelleher Drive and goes over to that swamp area. Now, what's happened over the number of years, in the last 50 years, is that the inlet underneath that pipe underneath Kelleher Drive, the inlet is, is lower than the outlet. So therefore, it can't take any water because the ditch on the other side of Kelleher Drive 
has been raised over the course of time. And that ditch eventually gets all the way down to where Mrs. Squarb used to live on Grave Street. And it connects in with Blacksmith Brook there and goes in underneath the fire station and down through. So that's so, on the south side. Yeah. So what yeah. in order to, to, to straighten out the whole area, it'd be nice if there was a conservation uh, grant or something to clean up those drainage ditches all the way through and make it work. Because it can't go it can't go through underneath Kelleher Drive because the inlet is lower than the outlet. Okay. Now there's only one other thing that there's also a pipe in the bottom of that little basin that takes the water behind Kelleher Drive on the north side of my property and dumps down into Buddy Brook. But when it dumps into Buddy Brook, after the Buddy Brook reaches a certain elevation, it won't take any more water. Okay. And yeah. then then it backs up because all the street drainage is all tied together. So I don't have, I understand what what uh, Mr. Heller is trying to do. We grew up farming in Deerfield and you had to keep your drainage dishes clean. If you didn't, uh, you were, you know, it would be wet and it'd be a real problem. Uh, my other concern deals with the fact that the hillside on the east end of his property and what have you, uh, there used to be a ski toe up there and what have you, Mr. Gaswinski had there 50 odd years ago. I never got to see it, but I heard it was there. But there's a lot of springs on a hill, okay? And are we going to upset and open up any of those springs that are going to send any more water down the hill? And if, if you know Callagher Drive at all, you get to the end of the culvert, I mean the cul-de-sac, and you go up the hill 150 feet and go to your right, there's a great big uh, spring there. And I, it's my understanding that at one time there was an easement to the Boston and Maine Railroad or the railroad. They sent water down to the center of town to, uh, to run the steam locomotives. And uh, that, that spring still runs. And, this, and it, you can oh, yeah. walk up to find it. Yeah, that's the that whole side of uh, uh, Comptick Ridge. Yeah, all the water comes uh, from the top, uh, going westly into the, the Deerfield River watershed area. So oh, yeah, I mean, a lot of water there. So I can answer some can... of those questions, but certainly yeah. not all of them. Um, yeah. The uh, the drainage that's we're planning is only for the level cropland. We're not going to be going above the berm uh, on the east side up the hill. So no disturbance uh, up there. And this is a pretty minimally invasive process. It's like a it's like a pipe layer or a hose layer attached to a tractor. Um, you're not going to see large a construction equipment in there tearing up the whole place it's it's pretty quick it's going to take uh three guys uh, a couple days to do it um believe it or not so um but yeah nothing up the hill um yeah I, i'm somewhat aware of all the other issues in with bloody brook i i heard that uh carolyn ness was um working with someone mm -hmm. today in fact walking through bloody brook to kind of oh, take inventory right. okay. of what's going on and yeah. i'm sure there's other things that can be done to improve um outlets um you know as far as culverts backing things up that's definitely a problem but uh, kind of outside the scope of what i'm doing but mike yeah. my question is i don't want to see any more water dumped in any faster into the bloody brook uh covered area and it, could there be a retention area to hold some of it back so it, it goes out gradually? And so it doesn't impact the, the houses and the drainage on all this stuff down here. And I'm not against you trying to do something. I'm just trying to say, let's try to figure it out so it doesn't cause any more problems down the, down the stream. Okay. It looks like somebody has their hand up. That's you, Bob. Um, that was me. Okay, okay, um, and I'm your your two minutes are up. Uh, I don't know if uh, you want to enforce yeah. that, Pete. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. It was a good conversation, and um, you know that was one of the questions I had asked earlier: is what the amount of additional water going into the brook would be, and um, I guess the amount would be um, the same. Um, it would just be 
does it change the uh, the flow patterns in the, in the rate? Um, So, I mean, the, the system would be designed to increase the rate. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that's going to translate to gushing, rushing water. I think it just, it, it, the field now is like a sponge. It kind of rains and it sits, um, and, you know, until the, it, it, it dribbles out. Um, yeah. So I think it, it, it exited the field faster in the past when the, uh, the drainage ditches were in better shape. Um, uh, but I, I can't, I don't yeah. know that it's possible to calculate what it would do downstream without some kind of NASA scientist. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's going to be a challenge. I, I can tell you, you know, Mr. Decker's right. It's going to come out faster. I don't know what that translates to in inches of Bloody Brook. Um, you know, Bloody Brook could be um, dredged out in some places, maybe to hold more water in front of our farm. There's already a big area that fills up with water as is, um, as everybody knows, sometimes it goes over the driveway, <laughs> but um, yeah. so there is kind of a holding area built in um, and maybe it, it could benefit from being increased in front of other properties, but um, that'd have to be a coordinated effort for sure. Yeah, no, and it was mentioned that there's a, um... A number of different studies that are occurring on the uh, Bloody Brook area. Um, it's like one of the other people involved. Um, so that is quite a, it's been channelized and it's been changed and sucked over over the years. And, and there's a lot of water flowing down through there. Um, the same amount of water we found in this is on the floating. Um, any other commissioners have any comments or thoughts on the questions that were raised? No, I don't see any. Somebody jumped in. Um, Can you provide the language of the motion you'd be looking for? Um, for the negative determination. Um. Can, can I uh, offer, I think it would be exempt under 10.04, uh, uh, 310 CMR 10.04, uh, seven. Uh, for the, uh, under, under the uh, form two, it would be a negative spot, and I believe. That's, That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, I don't know, do we have to... Um, yeah, I think it would be negative all five the area described is subject protection under the act. Since the work described meets the requirements of the following exemption that specified in the act and the regulations, no notice of intent is required. And then we just list the uh, exempt activity. Um, we know the discharge on site, you know, the amount of water will not change. We don't know. Anything, John, or other about the idea of a, a retention area, additional? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. With that exemption, whether we get to even approach that, because I believe it's all hands are tied by the regulation. Restoring the existing mandate of the water in the well, two options. Um, we could take a um, a motion. Um, and, and let me just before we talk to the commissioners, uh, is there any other public comment um, on this specific item right now? Okay, I don't see it. Um, so we could take the motion, John. We could do that, or we could um, 
continue the hearing and do a little bit more study on what maybe you know what DC may say about the uh, exemption um, that's in effect. I, I think we talked to DC about that. It seems to be straightforward, but um, do we want to take a, another few weeks to look at uh, like if we do anything with water flows or anything, or do we just do our motion to proceed? Any um, thoughts in the commission? I would tend to think that the existence of drainage ditches uh, prior for use to drain these fields would suffice for me uh, to make that this uh, fall under normal and routine maintenance um, as an exemption, um, in which case I don't see... Is it, <clears throat> uh, unless I'm wrong about that assessment, but that that's how I would view it from having read about it this week and, and read the comments from Mark. And even given that we don't have a specific outlet from a drain system before that was tile based, I feel that the drain system did exist and has ceased to function. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I would think that that would be defendable space. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ben or Ann Mary? Yeah, I'd agree to uh, move forward. I don't think that needs too much else. Okay. I agree. I think we can move forward. Okay. And um, as always, our decision can be appealed. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, if someone wants to make a motion on that, then um, we can, uh, or wait a minute, do I need to close out the hearing first? Before uh, yeah, I think uh, you should close out the hearing yeah. first. Okay. Unless there's any other comments from the commissioners or the public, I would uh, make a motion to close the hearing on um, the RDA for 144 North Main Street. Sean, let me make some motion to close the hearing on the RDA for 144 North Main Street. Okay. Second. I second. I'll second. Okay. Motion's on the table. Second. Any other chance or additional comments from the commissioners? Okay. We'll take a quick roll call to close out the, uh, the hearing. Uh, Sean Levy. Sean Levy, aye. And Ben Byrne. Ben Byrne, I. Uh, Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, I. Uh, Pete Law, I. So most of the photos uh, for And um, then we could take, open up um, the floor to the commissioners for a motion to, uh, to act on the, uh, the RDA request for determination at 144 North Street. Is I, I can try. Um, Sean would be make a motion uh, that we find a negative five form two um, for the RDA on 144 North Main Street um, exempt. Okay. Uh, Ben Byrne, Ben We've already closed the hearing. I see a hand up. The don't, the, the hearing is closed here. So, um, there's motion on the table. Do I have a second on that? Ben Byrne, second. Okay, any other comments from the commissioners? No, I think they can roll call the motion on the table to the, um, Proceed with a negative determination number five and the WPA point two uh, from the RDA at um, 44 North Main Street. Roll call, Tom Libby. 
Can we be I? Uh, Anne Mary Cloutier. Anne Mary Cloutier, I. Uh, ben Byrne. Ben Byrne, I. Uh, Pete Law, I. And motion passes four and zero, and uh, we can have that determination put up and put in place. Mr. Um, Allen, that will be done in the next week or so. Okay. Okay, right. so we'll get that written up and submit. All right. Thank you. Andrew. All right. Go through the, uh, the agenda for the next item up tonight is um, under general discussion, and this is going to be a presentation. Uh, from the open space and the recreation committee. And let's see, Julie uh, is tonight. Let's see, Julie Coswell, and maybe some other members as well. Uh, Julie, you have a lead on this, and I think you are, um, you have a PowerPoint presentation or whatnot, but um, if you want to proceed, then uh, we can go into listen mode and see what you got. Thank you. Um, I just hit the share screen and it says the host is disabled. I just opened that up. Um, okay. Sharing. Okay. So uh, give it a try again and you should be able to share. Okay. Yes. Here we go. Does that look good? Looks great. Okay, great. So uh, good, good evening, I'm Julie Caswell. I'm the chair of the Open Space and uh, Recreation Committee. And we have uh, with us um, Susan Half, who's a member of the committee, and then Deborah Yaffe, who's a volunteer on the committee. Um, and we sent a couple sort of documents of research that we've been doing um, on the uh, on these parcels. I'm hearing some. It's okay. Can Did we have Robert's me? iPad muted? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Um, some, you know, kind of uh, in depth research we've been doing on. Um, land in Deerfield, but uh, I thought that it would just be good to sort of take a, a step back and look at the, the bigger picture of uh, the work that the Open Space and Recreation Committee is doing on preservation and recreation on the Pecumtuck Ridge. And the reason for the conversation is that um, in looking at protection for parcels that the town owns on the ridge, um, the Conservation Commission has come in as a, as a means of um, getting that, that um, protection in place. And it would be something that we would hope to collaborate with the Conservation uh, Commission on. So what's been happening with uh, open space and recreation is the town has a new plan that was done in 2021, 2022. So the plan covers 2023 to 2030. And in that plan, um, the major priorities included increasing land that's under permanent protection in town and making Deerfield more walkable and hikeable. And that walkable and hikeable was a very strong part of what came back in our survey results in terms of what um, people in town wanted to see happen with open space. And um, at this point in town, in time, Deerfield has no official town trails or defined walking loops. So we're really starting from um, a zero level with the amount of uh, trail that, that the town has. So what we identified in doing the, um, the plan was, um, the plan has a list of, you know, extensive list of every part, all, all land in town and what protection status it has. And 
one of the things that we found was that there are um, at least five parcels of land in town that are not protected, owned by the town of Deerfield and have really good recreation potential. And so we identified five parcels, four were on the Pocumtuck Ridge, one on the Deerfield River. And in our subsequent discussions, we focused on the four parcels that are on the Pocumtuck Ridge. And these are owned by the town of Deerfield. Um, they're not permanently protected. That's what we thought was the case when we were writing the plan, but we subsequently did a lot of research as a committee to to find out what the, the protection status of these um, parcels are. They were acquired um, between 1926 and 1976. So, um, you know, in, in some cases up to almost 100 years ago, they don't have permanent open space protection. They have established trails on them for the most part, including the Pocumtuck Ridge trails. And I'm going to show you in just a second the map with with the um, with these parcels on them. And as of right now, um, although they're used by people um, in Deerfield and and other um, people from around the region, there's no indication on these town owned parcels that they're owned by the town of Deerfield. So you you have no perception that it's a, a town owned property nor a uh, perception about public access. Um, it's also the case that these parcels um, are identified in on the biomap, um, res resilient land database and the critical linkages database. These parcels are all um, identified as lands of high environmental interest. So they're of great interest from both a preservation, a conservation and a recreation um, perspective. So the four parcels that we're talking about are um, the gr light, light green ones here. They're um, uh, number one is Pocumtuck Rock. Um, number two is a Pine Nook Forest and number three is Steam Mill Forest. And they are, you know, next to each other. Um, it's really not possible to go from Steam Mill, which is the uh, number three on this map, to Pocumtuck Rock, because that's just up the sheer cliff of uh, Pocumtuck Ridge. Um, but the others are uh, one, uh, Pocumtuck Rock and Pine Nook Forest, which are number one and number two, are uh, next to each other. And then the fourth parcel that we're really interested in is the Birchwood Nature Refuge, which is off of Stage Road. Um, behind Stage Road and Pocumtuck Drive, um, and um, also has the Pocumtuck Ridge Trail um, going across it. So altogether, these four properties have 148 uh, acres. And what we were looking at, and please feel free to, to uh, ask any clarifications or, or questions that pop up as we go along, um, what we've been trying, to, what we've been working on as a committee after writing the plan is uh, seeking permanent protection for these parcels of land because they, they are owned by the town of Deerfield, but they do not have status as being um, permanently protected. And the first approach that the committee used was to collaborate with Franklin Land Trust. And we thought that we would, uh, a vehicle for getting this permanent protection would be to get conservation restrictions on the parcels. Those conservation restrictions would be held by Franklin Land Trust. It's turned out through our conversations with them that they didn't think that that was a feasible thing for the land trust to do. And what they did come back to us and suggest was that the most direct way to get permanent protection for these properties would be to uh, assure that they were recognized as being under Article 97 of the amendments 
to the Massachusetts Constitution and the Private Lands Preservation Act. So essentially that these town that these four properties would have the status of um, if there was ever a threat to their protection, that um, they would be under Article 97. And Article 97 basically, among other things, puts up a, a barrier if a, if a piece of property is going to be taken out of a protected uh, status and used for something else you have to get a vote um, in both houses of the state uh, state legislature. So it's, it's basically a, a pretty high barrier to, um, to taking lands out of, out, of, uh, out of preservation. So what we would like to talk, um, trying to move down here a screen. Oh, okay. So PowerPoint is not re responding. So I think I'll just, I'm, I'm about to uh, head off of this anyway. So I'm just gonna stop sharing at this point. Um, what we as a committee would like to talk to the Conservation Commission about is, is the steps that we might take to have this uh, recognition of these parcels under Article 97, and we've been asking lots of questions of lots of people about how this exactly works. And we're actually, rather than having a an idea about how to do it, we have a list of possible ways to do it. Um, we've asked the town uh, administrator to ask the town council to advise us on what would be the most, uh, the the right or the most best way to um, to get these lands under protection. Um, the Birchwood Nature Review Refuge is the so there's uh, really two sets two types of property here. The Birchwood Nature Refuge was given or bought actually by the town in 1976 and actually has uh, language about conservation use in it and says, the deed says that the property should be um, handed over to and managed by the Conservation Commission. So it has a sort of a status where it's already uh, has some deed language that indicates usage for, for recreation and conservation. The other three properties, Pecumtuck Rock, Steam Mill, and um, Pine Milk Forest were given to the town as forests, they were accepted by the town as forests. So uh, they could also be under the um, know, the control or the management of the conservation commission um, because they're because they were accepted by the town as forests. So we're not at a point yet where we have a. This is what we would ask or what we would like to do, but there are possibilities. And among the possibilities are that the land could be transferred from the people of Deerfield to the Conservation Commission and actually be under the direct auspices of the Conservation Commission. It may be possible that the, the town can simply vote in um, or that the town could vote to simply state that we consider these to be our Article 97 properties. There may be things that can be done with deed restrictions on the property. So in, in effect, we at this point, we don't know what's the mechanism for, uh, for getting this protection, but we are pretty sure it involves the Conservation Commission, and it would probably involve the lands being um, considered to be under the management of the Conservation Commission. The Open Space and Recreation Committee is very interested in doing the stewardship on the land uh, and working on trail development, et cetera, but um, the Open Space and Recreation Committee cannot uh, 
um, hold land or or be the the, the uh, person to uh, or the entity to uh, to provide that protection for the land. So that's where we're at. We have done a lot of research on these uh, parcels, and we're really interested in getting the permanent protection in place for its own uh, value and benefit. We're also interested in developing trail networks in the, on these pieces of property and having them under permanent protection is helpful in, it's not required, but it's helpful in going after trail grants because we're able to say that this land is under protection and will remain under protection um, in the future. So open to uh, questions and comments, uh, anything that um, uh, Sue or Deb wants to uh, add to what I had to say. You're muted, Sue. There it goes. Um, I, I think you've covered it pretty thoroughly. I mean, we've spent months on this and have talked to a number of uh, different entities. Uh, and as Julie said, there are, there are various ways that we can go, but uh, primarily it seems as though the Conservation Commission needs to be involved in some way or other. I uh, just mm -hmm. add, um, Andrea Liebson and I talked with Pete maybe, I don't know, maybe six months, some some months ago. Um, and it's my understanding that there is there aren't any lands that are in this category that we're, we want our, these parcels to be in. There's not currently any that are sort of under the auspices of the Conservation Commission at this point in time. Pete, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we do not know of any persons that are under our jurisdiction. Um, and as we did speak about, there's no, um, there's no conservation commission bylaws within the town of Deerfield um, that would allow us to do any of that to begin with, um, from my understanding. So that would be the first type of hurdle um, see what and we can work with the, uh, the town attorneys and, and uh, council, um, see what the hurdles may be um, from, the, from that side of it, from the ownership side of it. Um, I do have a bunch of bunch of specific questions, um, but I know Sean, you were, I think, had some questions you want to jump into. I was just going to say that, um... From personal experience working with other towns, um, it is quite common for the Conservation Commission to manage town forest lands um, in this nature. Um, and it doesn't preclude even active, say, forest management, if that is the case or the need or, you know, at least on the Pocomtic Ridge, you know, there may be issues with Hemlock, Willie Adelgid, and other things. So um, I have in my capacity, uh, as a service forester, have worked with um, multiple town conservation commissions, um, walking their properties and working with them towards uh, making a plan for forest management um, or even just developing that forest management plan. Um, and then sort of working with them uh, in private individuals in terms of if they're wanting to do mapping. Um, you know, like I almost thought that it, in in-house we could maybe work with the osrc um in com combination for doing some of those projects um in-house um, so but i don't think that there are significant hurdles to uh the conservation commission taking on that role 
Thanks for your insight. Uh, you, we deal with that on a daily basis on the phone, right? So that's very helpful. Um, any, uh, Ann Mary or Ben, anything that before I get into all my stuff? I mean, I agree with the spirit of it. Yeah. I'm not sure the mechanism to get there. Yeah. And that, and that speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. Um, so Juliana and, and, and Susan and Deb, um, I read through a lot of the details um, over the last few days. The initial question I had, uh, and, and you noted in your, your information sent to us, it says, after further evaluation, the Franklin uh, Land Trust concluded it would not be in a position to hold the uh, conservation restrictions. Its main concern was even if we successfully monitor compliance with the CR, given the multiple uses or the parcels, uh, hiking trails, um, et cetera. What would the details and what would our responsibilities then be if they're not willing to do so? Um, you know, what would we be able to do that they would not completely do? You know, what are those issues that uh, we would then potentially have to take responsibility for? Yeah, so I think what what um, the Franklin Land Trust, um, their lands committee were concerned about uh, if if they were holding conservation restrictions, then they have the responsibility to, they have a stewardship, they have stewardship over the conservation restriction. And so whatever the restriction says about usage on the property, they are, uh, they are not in the position to enforce it, but they are in the position to bring it to people's attention that the, uh, the restrictions are being not being followed or being violated um, in in some way, and um, the concern I think was um, mostly on Pecumtuck Rock and mostly around like mountain bike uh, trails, people using the trails as mountain bike trails. Um, so they felt that they would they could get in a position where they would, um, let's say um, somebody built or modified a trail without permission, and they would indicate that it was, that was happening, and uh, they would have to come to the town to say, uh, this is out of compliance, but there's really no um, enforcement mechanism at that point. They just felt that they would be kind of stuck in the middle without um without being able to <laughs> to to do much with the conservation restriction so they 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 didn't in the end want to hold the hold the stewardship responsibility how that would work with the town owning the land is that we are are basically our own stewards in that situation and uh, my understanding is that if that, uh, well, I'm not going to say my, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but the town would be uh, managing these trails and would, I think how it works is that the town actually has uh, sort of a right of protection for uh, people who are using the trails. So if, I think your question is around liability, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That we, we can mention. So it's it's a liability issue, and it's uh, so the town to to manage the trails, and, and so the town would take on the function of managing the trail. Uh, yes. The town then, uh, if it turned it over to the conservation uh, commission as the entity to manage, it would be then our responsibility. Um, for the management, um, you know, the, the wording of the, uh, you know, the care and control. Um, so then, if there were issues that, that something occurred, okay, you just mentioned, if somebody 
did something with bike trails or, or, or records that like, what would it be uh, potential enforcement uh, mechanisms be for that because within the, the weather protection act within the conservation commission is we work on the we have enforcement issues but it's always based on the wpa so i just kind of a little bit outside of my um area of knowledge so you know, so the liability that would then come over to the town the town has certain liability protection as a whole um but then what would the enforcement uh, mechanism be at that that level and, uh, I'm probably getting too granular here, but I'm just thinking kind of what uh, kind of what we bring on with uh, our accountability and responsibility. Right, and I think what uh, the Open Space and Recreation Committee is um, envisioning is that the management and stewardship of these properties would be. Um, under the responsibility of the Open Space and Recreation Committee. And that the Conservation Committee, and, and we have, I think we've talked about this in the, in the context of um, where we want to do uh, grant applications with mass trails and with other organizations, all of which have in place entire mechanisms around um, allowed uses, uh, et cetera. But that, that sort of the uh, planning and management would be part of the trail development and that that would not be the responsibility of the Conservation Commission because uh, we think it should be the responsibility of the Open Space and Recreation Commission. Um, but I, I would like to sort of make sure in my mind that these are, there are two separable issues here. One issue is making sure that we're in place to have the protection. And that doesn't, that doesn't, um, say that there's going to be a big trail system and there's going to be or a small trail system or any trail system but step one and and not uh you know not integral to step two is just getting the protection in place because these are these properties are just under regular zoning um in, in the town, um, when you look at a map of Deerfield and you wanna get a feel for how much uh, permanent protection of land there is on the Pecumtuck Ridge, these properties don't show up as being protected. Um, and I think uh, getting that permanent protection is important to making uh, Deerfield residents aware that they are the owners of parts of Pecumtuck Ridge and it's ours. But well, that doesn't that doesn't say that all the issues and concerns around trail management are not le they're legitimate concerns and ones that will have to be dealt with in the process of uh, planning. And at this point, um, it's kind of the Wild West. Um, there's no, uh, these lands are not marked as being owned to the town, owned by the town and access is, is, um, is free. So yeah, access is, is open. It's, it's another one of my thoughts and questions is like, how do, how do you, how do you, I, I guess it'd be trail signs and signs from the town of what the intent is of, of the land, who owns it, and so forth. Uh, but then, what other access issues? Some of these are uh, uh, up on the top of the ridge, there's the old Pine Brook, um, Pine Nook Road coming in there. Uh, would that be your access area? And where would people come in? On Birchwood? Um, the stage road area is 
pretty populated. It's, it's, and I'm not sure how many people are envisioning coming in there, or would there be other? If you go down to um, from the sugar loaf coming across on the on, um, on the road there, and that that parking lot is always pretty packed. Um, you know, it's just so just access in general, but I think there's lots of other um, you know details to to things. So I understand that the process of protection first, uh, but then if we do that, we take that on. Um, I think we do have to do some more um, due diligence of what that would actually mean in terms of the details. So we want to do the protection uh, on the land, which uh, um, I think we, we all agree with it would be a, a wonderful thing, especially open up for recreational activity. Um, the recreational activities would be the definition. Um, mountain biking is great, but can you have a mountain bike with all sorts of other stuff going on and you know, trail deteriorations and human gains and, and all that kind of good stuff? Um, so I think there, there's, um, you probably need to do some study on just the mechanisms of transfer to the Conservation Commission um, and before accepting from that. Uh, really do uh, a little bit more due diligence of uh, understanding what that might uh, entail either for the town or for the Conservation Commission per se. Um, and I know you guys have been working on this for two or three years and um, we have a, a lot of these details and we're just, we're just starting to learn about it a little bit here, uh, trying to figure some of this out. So it is a mechanism from the Conservation Commission. Um, you know, if that does work, I think that's a great thing. Uh, we just need to understand, you know, what we sign off for and, and uh, what we incorporate. So, and Sean, I think you know some of the different towns, and maybe we can get an understanding. You know, if you had specific towns, we could reach out to them and how they put all these things together um, and work with the different you know communities and, and so. We can talk about that. Yeah, point. I'm happy to do that. I will yeah. say that the character of my hill towns is a bit simpler in the sense <laughs> that they probably just agreed that it was Article 97 lands. You know, and it, I can find out. Because a lot of times land is donated directly to the Conservation Commission. It's more rare to have an open space committee than it is, you know, so in the smaller towns, you might only have a CONCOM um, as the receiver of that land. Um, and often the town forests do not get a lot of attention. Um, so they're often not identified. People don't know they're there. Uh, they, they just go by passing time you know, serving their needs as wildlife and habitat, but really not with uh, uh, public access and enjoyment that could also be reaped. So I've been on all these properties, even the one off of the deer field off the end of Mill Village and uh, Wells Cross. I pulled a boat out of there. Um, right. <laughs> I have utilized every one of these properties and look forward to uh, incorporating them uh, into uh, the Conservation Commission's role. So... Hey, Chad, do you know if, there, if it's listed as a uh, town force? Um, it's a note to me that a special town force committee should be composed of three members, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, oversight by the commission, uh, conservation commission, I believe. Do you know how that works in other towns? Do we have to set up a There are other towns that have a town. There are towns that have a town forest committee. I think East Hampton may have a town forest committee. Um, I don't see the need. Yeah. yeah, I suppose we could discuss the mechanisms of it. My uh, my middle field has a town forest um, that they're very proud of, but they haven't been able to do much with. Other towns have gone as far as we could have a forest management plan, uh, a municipality is uh, available to apply to the cost share from the state to get a forest management plan developed. Um, and in the course of that forest management plan, it, we could incorporate the trail, uh, at least mapping. Um, so mm -hmm. there are lots of ways to get um, services on, these, on this property. Um, and honestly, it, some of that could even be done through the open space committee. Um, you know, I on, I think these lands have some protection at being town owned and submit, you know, purchased at least the three for town forest purposes. 
Um, I think they're perfect for Article 97. Maybe the better question for legal is, um, is there anything that would keep us from wanting to put all of four or all five parcels in Article 97? Is there anything that Article 97 precludes that we might need in the future? Um, maybe down on the, specifically I'm thinking of the, the fifth parcel off of the Deerfield River. Um, there's not a lot of Deerfield River access. I don't know if Article 97 allows for, say, change of use tour to improve access for small boats. Um, you know, it might just be protective. I'm not sure the details of Article 97, the way Julie and the, their committee is. I have also pulled a boat out from there and it makes it a little easier. <laughs> yeah, before Williams put a giant pile of Irene debris in front of it, blocked the access. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, you know it may it may be the case that in effect these parcels already have Article ninety seven protection because of how they were acquired and et, et cetera. But um, I know, like with the Birchwood, it was acquired. It was uh, acquired by the town and supposed to be under the conservation commission and i i just don't think that ever happened that tra right. that um not that i know I, of and i don't think there's a mechanism so i think you know and as john said and i think everybody agrees that it, it probably does make some sense um for transfer of these properties to the conservation commission um and, but then we'd have to you know do some additional work on um you know, the, the management and stewardship side of things and, and mm -hmm. how that works out. Uh, we we don't, definitely would have to understand from council um, how that transfer would occur. Um, do you know, did, did this go, if if it was put in place, would that require the town meeting vote to make that transfer to the conservation commission? I don't know at this point. That's what that was a, one of the sort of list of questions that we've sent yeah. to town okay. council. Okay. I wonder, I'm sorry, I just had a question. I wonder mm -hmm. if this isn't a slippery slope that lends itself for something like the trustees of the conservation, something like that. I wonder if that isn't um, sort of the place that they fill sometimes. And I'm not suggesting it suggesting anything i'm just wondering if um there is an organization that could help us with this sort of transitional like whether it's um the trustees of the reservation or some other uh, organization like that once again i'm 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 not saying that i know that that's the mechanism mm -hmm. trustees is a very large organization and they have their own ways of doing things. Um, I don't know how much our voice would uh, reach their ears. Um, yep. Uh, and and as far as uh, it's it's common for people to say, "Oh, if we do this, we're going to have hordes of people," and and it was a legitimate uh, point to say that uh, Sugarloaf, of course, is it's it's one of the prime walking places, but Sugarloaf is a state owned uh, facility. Uh, they have facilities up on the top. They have a building and, a, and an observation area. They have a paved road up there um, and these these parcels are not anything like that. There are some people who walk on them now, but they're not they're not well known and highly used. And we've done some little preliminary looking at um, an example of how many cars could be accommodated. And if you just have a little trailhead that'll only hold five cars um i think 
as far as what our experience has been, what we think it's been <laughs> with the number of people uh, up there, that it's yep. it, it's common. I mean, it, it's it's just it. I shouldn't say common. It's not not highly used. People who are real hikers know about it, and they go up there, but. Um, how many other people are going to be uh, rushing to get to them is um, that's questionable at the po at the moment. Okay, thank you. And I think um, you know, circling back um, to the the trustees' question, I think they pretty much uh, well, they are essentially a land trust operation. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have been very closely um, collaborating with Franklin Land Trust. So I, I think we've gathered that expertise that that they have. Um, and I think we really are back to the, the point of um, our town council has to have be able to uh, advise us as to what are the next steps? And I think this conversation um, is really important for the Conservation Commission to know that this is what the Open Space and Recreation Committee is working on this protection and um, for us to be collaborating with each other on how it might be best to accomplish this. Um, this protection. And I'm hearing a lot of, I think, support from the conservation committee members that this is, you know, this is a good thing to do. Um, the protection part, and then we have work to do on the, um, on the next steps of stewardship uh, issues. Yeah, so I'm going to say what are the next steps, but I, I think you uh, just kind of outlined the town council, um, you know, information there. I mean, uh, first, first at the you know, protection area and then like the due diligence steward, uh, stewardship uh, role. Um, um, and then I think what specific next step, what, how, where do we want to proceed uh, on this um, at this point? And I think um, working, uh, bringing in Sean's background and knowledge on the forestry part is really important at this point. Um, these are town forests, um, I think. They were accepted as town forests by the at town meeting under warrants. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if that means, uh, then we would need to figure out the logistics of essentially having them listed as being under the Conservation Commission as opposed to the people of Deerfield, which may be a vote at town meeting. Um, again, we're back to, we need advice from from the council, but the fact that they are for us and the fact that Birchwood is um, was accepted and is supposed to be at the Conservation Commission, um, that all bodes well for, I think, being able to have them under the protection of the Conservation Commission. All right. Well, it seems, we, uh, it seems like we're going to need to hear from town council and probably sit down with Council and uh, administrator and maybe select board and see uh, you know, what the steps are, what, what's needed going forward, what the process would be. They're going to have to outline the process for us, uh, uh, what they need from uh, regulatory and the, the legal side of things. And then um, that will lead into what we can and cannot do uh, going forward. And then 
can probably lead into the, the conversation of the ownership versus the stewardship um, roles and responsibilities and um, you know, who's, who's responsible, who's accountable, et cetera, et cetera, um, all the different things, you know, and just keep flowing down. But uh, I think we need that answer um, initially from town council, from the administrator, uh, maybe select like board of this is the way they want to go and this is the process they, that we really need to follow uh, to get there, the legal process, et cetera. And then um, we can, you know, and give us our marching orders and see uh, how, what next steps we have to take down the road because um, there'll be a lot of a lot of details on our question in something like this and the uh, first time that the uh, the town has really tried this so it's, you know, things will okay. pop up for sure <laughs> um john and mary uh ben any other comments concerns just keep uh keep everybody informed of the next steps or, or is there anything else? No. Uh if if it's uh okay with uh the your uh the conservation commission, I would I'd go back to the request that we have uh, for advice and um say that we met Open Space Committee met with the Conservation Commission in this meeting and discussed um, uh, discussed this issue. I guess my question would be, how would you like me to characterize you support the idea? Um, I think there would be, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, uh, you know, there's a, a definite level of support. Um, uh, Pursuant to understanding a lot of the additional details of uh, the process going forward, yeah. uh, I, you know, I think the uh, the background would be there, there is a level of support for the the premise of the open space and the conservation commission um, taking a bit a much more active role here, um, but that would be based on understanding uh, of regulatory uh, and legal. Avenues and requirements. John, you're laughing at me. <laughs> Pete worries too much. This is what <laughs> Pete does, and it's why he's our fearless leader. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have no doubt that uh, the Conservation Commission and the Open Space uh, Recreation Committee can work really well hand in hand uh, on these projects moving forward. So I am very excited, um, and I'm. You know, I'm happy to work with the Open Space Committee and uh, our town service forester, who is not me. <laughs> um, but we could meet on site and take a walk, too. Um, but once we know who's in control, we can access, like you were looking at, grants. Mm -hmm. So it, it does help alleviate that process. Um at least on the state side for forestry grants. I know nothing of the trail grant stuff, but I think it's all very exciting and promising and nice that we have these lands to um, to think about, so. And Sean, what, me, Mary? <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> I would have it no other way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we take care of a, a lot of details and we take care of each other, I think it's great, so good. Yes, so I think we can move you. ahead with that, you know, kind of normally have the conversation and uh, move forward and see what comes next. Right. Thank you any, so much. Yeah. Any other comments? Because I think there's a few uh, from the public. Uh, just yes, yeah. to any other comments? Mm -hmm. Just a general discussion at this point. I don't want to uh, exclude anybody. Uh, okay. No, I, I think we're good. And uh, first step, and many more steps to come. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Thank you very much. And okay. If there's anything else we do have on the agenda, uh, open for public comment for any other issues. I'm not sure if there's anybody that. To talk about anything else that we haven't, otherwise, we'll move on to the mail. 
that we have received this past month. Um, it's all in the meeting packet. I'm looking at it on my other screen. Um, the first letter we received, uh, like a letter from uh, Eversource Energy, uh, just informs the commission that the Eversource intends to selectively apply herbicides in 2024 along the power line rights of way. Um, and this is um, part of their five year management plan that's been posted. So it's just letting us know they're going to be doing that. And uh, this this year, uh, they also sent another letter. I think it was a little later in the book. Um, that describes the upcoming five year vegetation management plan for all of West Massachusetts, and they provided us with um, um, some mappings and so forth. That's here. It's the uh, letter of February twentieth. Um, uh, it's the Western Mass 2024 to 2020 five year vegetation plan. Um, which goes through, um, goes through the uh, Department of Agriculture Resources, et cetera. And, and then we also have a letter from National Grid on uh, notification of utility maintenance activities. Um, on some transmission line sort of warnings and you can write a race in the future. And I believe that was all a mail and you all have comments or uh, copies of that. And um, any questions on the mail received from uh, Eversource and or uh, National Grid? Well, three, three, four notices from what I see. Okay, uh, items unanticipated within the last 48 hours. I just have two things. Um, did schedule a site visit tomorrow at 10 a.m. at 19 Captain Lathrop Road. Um, this is a homeowner. Uh, this is a little uh, brook behind the, uh, the home. Uh, he's wondering what he could do with a lot of knotweed and there's also some downwinds and such that he'd want to remove. Probably be a, 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 a mechanism um, excavator type of thing to take out of the water. So maybe some can't do it, but it's the initial site review before we can uh, move forward. So we're just going to take a look and see if we can give them some information. So that would be tomorrow morning at, at uh, 10 o'clock if anybody can make it. Um, quick update from Sean. I'll get the update a bit, but the treehouse signage update, the treehouse signage is moving forward, I understand. Where'd Gretchen go? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We've uh, we've set another meeting schedule. Uh, we sent a email off to uh, the design team at Treehouse. In fact, we didn't get anything back. Yeah. So, uh, but that's okay. Um, we, we didn't have anything to give them. We were just letting them know we were still alive and working. So yeah. we had another productive meeting. Um, I think another two meetings and we'll have some work product to give off to Treehouse Design Team. Um, yeah. So Yeah, and that's how I'll wrap up. I'll uh, send them another note saying that we're all done and you know, we'll a little fire under them, see what they can do from their marketing team. That'd be great. Um, the last thing I had is I did send a letter, if you talked about last month, to uh, company farms about the detention pond and outlined various um, conditions that we would like to see. Uh, I have not heard back from uh, their uh, their contact there yet, so that one is still uh, up in the air, outstanding a little bit, but uh, we have moved ahead in um, the orders that we would like to see while they're doing the um, Water removal from the extension pipe, which I will get here the other day. So I think they really need some work. Um, would be good to see. Other than that, anything else from the commissioners at this point? Any other comments? Comments? Looks like good. Other than that, I think we can. Uh, the next meeting will be on April 25th at 6 p.m. And uh, other than that, unless there's anything else, I take a motion to uh, adjourn.
I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting at 737. I second it. All right. Motion on the table. Any other comments? Um, so you a quick roll call on the motion to adjourn. Sean Libby. Sean Libby, aye. And Mary Clutier. And Mary Clutier, aye. Uh, ben Byrne. Ben Byrne, aye. Uh, and Pete aye. So as I say, Amy, that's what we're asking. Thank you for everything. Thanks.